let's see. So I just lost the connection for the other piece. Uh, it told me the Wi-Fi cut out and then it simply stopped the broadcast. So I hope that some of you will notice that we're now on a new Live at Five. Um, if not, I hope that you can come back and watch this later, but we left off learning about the vacuum cleaner. Today's Live at Five is coming to you from the Frank Lloyd Wright Design Smith House. I'm Kevin Adkison with the Center for Collections and Research, and we're talking about the different tools and techniques used to care for the collections of our house museums. So we just left off uh, talking about HEPA vacuums, and the HEPA filter is going to keep the dust from being able to exit the vacuum. You do wear it as a backpack. And so especially here at the Smith House where things are pretty tight, you have to be very conscious about what is ahead and behind you. And then it is a variable speed vacuum. And so you hold this nozzle in your hand. And if we had more textiles and more delicate materials to care for, they make dozens of different nozzles that we would use for special textiles. Um, but you can actually control the suction of the vacuum. And so you can control the, how much um, energy is expended. And then there's also a handy little um, valve here where you can uh, up, uh, raise the suction up and down. And what's interesting about this vacuum, it is not like your Dyson where it's sort of going to hold a bowling ball through the suction. It can actually run really, really gently because what you're really trying to do is simply lift the dust in any type of insect particle out of the textile, you're really not trying to sort of clean up Cheerios from the kitchen floor. And so it's very, very gentle on our materials. And then there's also the concern of how um, the vacuum is going over the piece. And so you want to make sure that when you vacuum a historic item, like one of these pillows, that you don't just run the vacuum over it because it could snag one of these pieces, pieces of the fringe and simply unravel the weaving. And so you use a nylon piece of netting that has an edge. You, if you make your own, you just use nylon netting and then put tape around the edge. And so you place this down and then you vacuum across the nylon. And that keeps the art object safe and it allows any sort of dust and particles to come through into the vacuum. And so on the pillows, it's a pretty quick job. It's a little bit more laborious to do a textile like Urban Japina's tapestry. And usually when I have you over for a tour or for a live at five, I've already taken off this protective cover. Uh, this protective cover is actually our first line of defense against dust and also light damage. So one of the important um, lessons of caring for your collection is to do preventative conservation. And so what, what can you do for an object so that you don't have to do more aggressive cleaning? Or what can you do so that it's not going to get damaged um, not on view. It's why if you ever go to, to a museum and they have their works on paper covered by velvet cloths and you lift them up and you think, what's it going to be? Is it going to be a Maplethorpe under there? And then it's, you know, a little pastel. That's just to keep light damage from uh, ruining an object when no one's looking at it. So if no one's in the house, we keep this textile covered in black Tyvek. The black blocks uh, visible light, the Tyvek blocks UV light, and it works in partnership with the UV film that's already on the window. So we have two lines of defense against UV rays. Uh, and then the Tyvek itself as a synthetic on the wool keeps it from pulling. So if we had a, a, a sheet over this and it was cotton on wool, it would create friction and it would create piling. So we want to use the Tyvek to run smoothly over the wool. When it comes time to vacuum this, I lay the nylon screen down and then you simply vacuum over the nylon screen. Of course, modern art weaving will often have unusual materials. And so there are these copper strips in here that pretty much preclude us from ever using any type of water to wash this textile. If damage were to occur, um, if, if someone spilled a pin or makeup or something even worse on this piece, it would have to be taken down to the uh, 
uh, conservation laboratory because we would never uh, try and clean it with any type of wet solution because of the metal in the piece. So what else can I talk about? I think maybe it will be interesting. Um, and if you're just joining me, this is a, a, a live at five in two parts. I'm not sure why it kicked me off. Um, it's done this one other time, and that was when I was low on phone memory, but I checked my phone memory before we started, and we were great, so I apologize for that, but thanks to everyone who's come back on. Um, when we're thinking about cleaning pieces, like I said earlier, the best way to break an item is to move an item. So if I can clean it in situ, I'm going to. And so to, to get the sort of dust out of the Maya Grotel vase, I might add those bean bags to either side to keep it from falling over. And then I would just swiffer the inside or use the vacuum cleaner very gently to run through the inside. Um, the A piece like this that is a natural botanic, I am just not going to clean it. Um, this piece is over 65 years old, uh, arranged likely by Mrs. Smith, who was interested in Ikebana. Uh, and there's really no way for me to clean this without damaging the piece. There would be no way to move this down to Cleveland to get it to the conservation lab. And so its best way to be preserved is for us not to do anything. The same might be true of this uh, little woven piece here, where if I took the Swiffer to it, it's probably not going to do anything other than add Swiffer fibers to the piece. Uh, a cotton rag's not going to clean it, so the best way to clean it would be to vacuum it, but even that might damage the piece more than clean it. So we really don't do anything to care for this object other than let it rest. When you're working with multiple materials, you get into the problems where it is actually best to handle ceramics without gloves because you want to be able to grip the piece and you want to be able to feel the piece. But you never want to touch metals with, without a gloves because your fingerprints will create corrosion. And you'll actually see in a lot of museum collections, uh, they have corrosive fingerprints where maybe 30 years ago someone touched an object without a glove and then the spot slowly but surely corrodes. So if it has metal, if it had metal glaze or metal paint, I would wear a glove. That's always first and foremost, metals equal glove. Um, and then you want to check and see, is this thing actually attached before I start to clean it? Because if the mushroom sort of fell off the top, that could cause damage. It is attached, but there's another reason why I won't clean this object any more than with a dust cloth, and that is this crack. And so you never want to clean an object that's going to cause a crack to expand. Uh, and in this piece, it's really quite obvious it has a crack, but when you're thinking of porcelain plates or antique dishes, especially anything with a handle, so an antique teacup or an antique um, uh, tea kettle, it's highly likely, depending on how old it is, it's highly likely that it's already broken and been repaired. And you can see that if you just take a black light over the piece, you'll see if it's been repaired. If you can visibly see that it's been repaired, um, uh, be careful, and then never, ever move a valuable vase or, or, or pitcher that you love by the handle. If you're still using it, these things were made to be used, use it by the handle. But if, you're, if you would be devastated if it shattered, pick it up with both hands by the body of the piece, because the handle is always going to be the weakest part, especially on an older vessel if it has been repaired before. And so since I've seen that crack, we pretty much leave these two pieces, the woven piece and the broken metal mushroom cloud, exactly where they are. And we do a dusting around it, but we don't want to move the object and cause more damage. Um, then there are always surprises like this little piece that looks wooden, but is actually plastic. It can be Swiffered, another Glen Michaels that we're not really going to clean other than try and get any sort of visible cobwebs. Because why are we cleaning? Well, to stop any sort of corrosion or damage, but mostly we're cleaning so that these pieces can be appreciated on a tour. And so if the dirt and grime, it's more dangerous to get it out of the piece than it is to leave it there, uh, and it's not stopping our appreciation, then I'm going to leave it there. What would stop our appreciation are things like on this um, 
uh, reproduction Rodin, which I noticed today has a full sort of cobweb festival with little bugs behind it. If you notice that on a tour, you would think, oh wow, Cranbrook doesn't maintain their houses. And so that's the kind of stuff that I am really looking most for, um, where it's prohibiting our appreciation of the object. And I actually left that there for you. We just got the coffee tables back today and that had been living over on the floor. And when I pulled it out from the wall, I saw those pieces and thought, perfect for a lesson. Uh, question about the floors. Um, we actually, you know, that is a great question. We have owned this house for three years. Um, and there are a lot of options with what we could do for the floors. Um, at the moment, we, uh, we sweep the floors or use a Swiffer, a dry Swiffer after every tour. Um, so we do have a housekeeper for this house. Um, and Janet was actually hired by Mrs. Smith in 1985. And so she's the housekeeper has, that, who has been cleaning this house for 35 years, longer than I've been alive. And we really rely on Janet's expertise. She knows so much about not only uh, the house and how she has maintained it, but how Mrs. Smith liked to maintain it. And so she has lessons from the family about where the furniture went, um, what, what Mrs. Smith was insistent on, sort of her quirks as a, as a housekeeper. Uh, we reviewed everything that she was using to clean the house. We recommended some changes for products that were too aggressive. And so now she um, cleans it uh, really based on her experience and then our recommendations. So we dry clean the floors and then about once a month we do mop the floors. Um, Leslie, if she's still watching, can correct me. I'm not sure what we use in the floor. Uh, I know we were using one of those sort of mop and glow products, which we don't want to use because that's so aggressive um, and it will build up layers and it actually builds up layers that get stuck to the furniture. So part of the furniture restoration was scraping off decades worth of mop and glow on the bottom of the furniture. And so, um, Eventually, uh, the furniture, the floors will need to be waxed. Um, and so either using a paste or a butcher's wax, or we'll use a synthetic because it is a working house museum and the wax is easier to damage. So it's always this balance of what would be best if no one's ever going to walk on the floor and then what's best realistically for it as a museum. We never oil the woods. Those actually counterintuitively will dry out your wood. Uh, it, it does not Wood does not need to be moisturized it, or conditioned is another term. There are a lot of really sort of bad things you can do to your furniture. Um, you can wax your furniture once or twice a year. Um, uh, again, using a paste or a butcher's wax, but never use any type of spray, any type of pledge, anything with silicone on it is doing more damage than good. I don't know if anyone has any other questions. I hope that this was interesting um, as we go about reopening the houses. Um, a lot of the dirt and cobwebs that I see now thinking about the visitors have not been visible on the Live at Five tours. And so we have not been uh, doing as much of our maintenance as usual. Uh, my next project after I hang up with all of you is to make more barriers um, between the rooms because the tours are going to be much more self-guided than they were. Um, the cleaning cycle, great question. Um, the uh, Leslie helps manage that and Janet comes once a week, particularly because of the floors with dirt and debris from the tour guest. And so she's dealing with any type of rocks and leaves every week. And then she has a calendar where essentially every six weeks she's looking at a different zone. Um, and so she'll dust the living room shelves and the living room desk one week, the dining room and dining room shelves one week. And so she goes zone by zone. And that's really enough. Um, you don't want to overclean uh, and, and damage an object. And it's also just more likely to damage an object if you are picking it up and dusting it every week. And we I do request that Janet actually is not picking up these objects. So she is doing surface cleaning um, around pieces. And then uh, Leslie and I come in and do the actual object maintenance and object cleaning. One thing we I forgot to mention is do we ever sort of use uh, water or take something to the sink? Uh, really, no. Um, if it's a metal object, water will ruin it faster than 
I mean, within a year, it will be ruined. And if it's a ceramic object, you might think, um, uh, you might think, oh, this ceramic is going to be able to get cleaner if I soak it or if I take it to the sink. Well, think of all the times that you might um, uh, that you might message uh, or that you might mess up a ceramic if you took it to the sink. First of all, carrying it to the sink, you might drop it. Second of all, think about where the faucet is going to be or where the edge of the sink is and how easy it would be to chip this piece in the sink. And then there's the principle of the ceramic itself. If I get closer, you'll see the little holes. It's porous and you can easily uh, permanently ruin a ceramic piece by soaking it in water and essentially re-wetting uh, the ceramic clay body uh, and, and it, will, it will forever be changed. And so you really never want to take any ceramic to the sink and try and wash it that way. When in doubt, um, we use nitrile because we have a staff member with latex allergy. I'm not sure uh, if latex gloves shred. Most museums I've worked at have, have used nitrile, not latex. And then cotton gloves can be useful um, under certain circumstances, but we really prefer nitrile because the cotton, if you touch a sort of basket or a it, we'd never use cotton with a uh, textile because the fibers from the cotton gloves will get intermingled with the, the fibers from the textile. Um, you, when handling wooden objects, fiber or ceramics or glass, the best practice is actually to simply wash your hands, apply no lotion, use no perfume soups, uh, soaps, and then uh, handle the object with your clean bare hand. The gloves are absolutely necessary for metal objects, painted objects, or anything else where the oils from your hand could do lasting harm. Um, to the question about um, who the Smiths were, um, if you look back on the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research Facebook video page, um, I have done multiple tours here at the Smith House. And so today's tour was just about care and handling of our collections. Um, but to learn more about the house, I have given a, um, a full walking tour on Facebook Live, as well as some specific tours about the ceramics and about the furniture. You can also sign up for a tour. The tours reopen this Friday, September 11th and continue on until the uh, Thanksgiving weekend, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 1 p.m. And at 3.30 p.m., we have a tour of the Frank Lloyd Wright, or of the Aliel Saarinen House. So Smith House tours are at 1 p.m., Saarinen House tours are at 3.30 p.m. They are limited to just six guests. They're an hour long. You do need to wear a mask outside and inside. Um, whoever you come with, you'll stay with as a group uh, and you'll stay six feet apart from other guests in the house. Um, tours are $35 and help support the ongoing preservation and education mission here of the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. Um, I lead tours on occasion. Um, I think that they have sold out this weekend, but I am leading Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I think they're all sold out, unfortunately but you can check on center.cranbrook.edu. Um, I'm, I'm not scheduled to lead any other tours this year. Um, as far as other ways to engage with the center, on September 22nd, if that is a Tuesday, uh, I am giving a lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan. And many of you may not know that Frank Lloyd Wright, um, from about 1910 to 1925, made most of his income as a dealer in Japanese prints and not as an architect. He loved Japanese architecture, Japanese culture, Japanese art. And so his uh, love of Japan was really became infectious and his clients also love Japan. And so uh, you'll see the Smiths have things like a Japanese um, tea, uh, implement hanging in the fireplace. They also have dozens of books on the art of Japan and Japanese prints and drawings. Um, and so I'll be delivering a Uncovering Cranbrook lecture about Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan. That's Tuesday, September 22nd at 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. $20 
uh, for tickets for those lectures, and they're all virtual. So I hope that you'll head over to center.cranbrook.edu and sign up for the uh, virtual Uncovering Cranbrook lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan. Um, do we change out some of the items here in the house? Um, not really. Uh, the, the house was left to us lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, this was all of the Smith's items. This is everything that they lived with in the house. The family took nothing when they gave it to Cranbrook in 2017. Mr. and Mrs. Smith last lived here full time in 1984. She lived here through the 90s uh, before moving out with her family to California, but she took nothing with her from the house. And so uh, this is a real treasure that we have everything that the original builders and owners of the home to school teachers who had a dream to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house uh, left their entire collection to Cranbrook. I do rearrange it based on historic photographs, and so I update the tables. We jog between sort of 1972, 1978, and I do different tablescapes based on historic Polaroids from Cranbrook archives that are part of the Smith family collection. Um, we don't do much seasonal decor. Uh, uh, we do put out the family menorah for Hanukkah, um, but that's about it. Um, we don't do any sort of special holiday tours like they do over at Cranbrook House with holiday tables and holiday splendor uh, led by Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary. Uh, the landscaping, um, uh, I do need some do not walk on the grass signs because the grass has been recently planted. We've regraded, we've restored the historic edges of the driveway and all of it is in a rather fragile condition. So Home Depot did not have any stay off the grass signs. So I bought some spikes and I will be making some stay off the grass signs before Friday at one o'clock so that I have no rogue visitors trying to destroy my hill, uh, which eroded away over the years and at great uh, labor and expense has been reconstructed. So we'll be doing another special event in October talking more about the landscape, its design and restoration, um, which has been uh, planned by Quinn Evans, architects of Ann Arbor, and executed by Fleur Detroit of Bloomfield Hills. Uh, just earlier today, the man in the moon made it back out there, me and my shovel. If it seems like I do everything. That's because we're a very small team here at the center, and so the curator does plenty. But I don't do it alone. I do it with my colleagues, including Leslie Mayo, the associate registrar, and then I also do it with the countless experts in the field. And so when I have a question about cleaning an object, if I'm not sure what to do, um, I go to places like Winterthur Caring for Your Collection, which is the sort of magnum opus of museum care and handling, that's a book, um, but also resources from the Royal Society of, of Art Handlers and the Royal Society of Exhibit Designs to the Getty Conservation Institute. There are lots of resources online. And then I can always email my colleagues and say, what do you think the best practice is here? It's all about making a plan, finding the information, and never just thinking, oh, I think I can get that off with this. That is the way that you ruin an object. So careful planning is the key to any type of care and handling. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today for another Live at Five. I hope that you enjoyed this one. It was a little bit different from our usual Live at Fives, um, but I hope that it was just as interesting. There's always stuff going on behind the scenes to make sure that when you come through the house, you see this and you think, oh, what a beautiful work of architecture because all of this care and handling, the whole reason that we preserve these objects is to share the beauty of the place and to share um, the story of Frank Lloyd Wright, of Cranbrook Academy of Art and our art, uh, many artists who came out of Cranbrook. And of course, the story of Nelvin and Sarah Smith who built and realized this uh, dream. And so all of the work of preservation and cleaning is so that those stories are front and center and can be front and center for generations into the future. And so all of this is really meant to be behind the scenes so that you can appreciate the objects at their best. Um, now that you know a little bit more, you can picture me like a Ghostbuster with my vacuum, uh, vacuum backpack cleaning away frantically for the 
next two days before the tours. Um, and then later this fall, we'll have a, a walk around of the landscape and talk about that project. It is not quite finished now. There are a few plants that need to be planted in the winter and a few that need to be planted in the spring. Some were um, uh, species that just aren't in the nursery. And so they were too fragile this spring to be planted and they need another year in the greenhouse before we'll plant them out front. But it is looking pretty amazing. So if you can, if you're in the area, if you're local, book a tour and you can come on an in-person tour and you can see our new landscape restoration and you can see the clean and glorious house here. Thanks so much for following along. Sorry that it got divided into two parts um, and I'll see you next Wednesday for another Live at Five.